preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hi. So where do I begin by saying I'm sorry? By telling you my name so that you can all call me tomorrow morning and write me letters. Uh, technical difficulties. We uh, really the truth. Uh, we've had a very difficult time with the sound system. We have C-SPAN taping this evening, and we are very, very sorry. But please, whatever it is, take it out on me, because we've got a wonderful group of people back there who I know you came to see. So I'm going to make this really quick. I'm Deborah Nadell McGee, the director of the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the 92nd Street Y. And tonight's program, Comparing Notes, Politics Can Be Funny, features our moderator and very dear friend, Leonard Lopate, who is the host of the WNYC radio talk show, New York and Company, as well as the television show, Conversations with Leonard Lopate, which can be seen live on Friday nights and again on Sunday mornings. Joining Leonard tonight are Kate Clinton, Gail Collins, Bruce McCall, and Calvin Trillin for an evening of political humor. Ooh, okay, that's good. <laughs> Couldn't make it. Leonard will tell you about him. Uh, <laughs> Pardon? Oops. Um, at any rate, you also will have the opportunity to write your questions on cards, which you have received as you walked into the hall, so that you can um, have your questions answered by these wonderful people on stage tonight. I just want to tell you a little bit about what's upcoming in our Comparing Notes series. We have Radio Talk on November 18th with Lynn Samuels, Lisa Evers, and Joan Hamburg. We will really start that one on time. I remember the 60s with Peter Max and Cousin Brucey on January 13th. That should be fun. And on February 22nd, Restaurants, the front of the house with Danny Meyer, Karen Waltuck, and Alice Waters. Yeah. So for now, I know you're really ready to laugh. You're really ready to have some fun. So here's Leonard. Thank you, Deborah. This panel discussion arises from a conversation I had with Christopher Buckley at a book party for Tom Wolfe, so you know it was a heavy situation. Mr. Buckley was the first person who agreed to be on this panel, but I recently received a rather apologetic letter from him explaining that he's been sent to Asia on assignment. I swear it's true. Considering what's been happening recently in Pakistan and Malaysia and Indonesia, we can only hope that he's not in a prison cell in Jakarta. There have been riots there recently, and they're definitely not laugh riots. But if anyone can find something funny about politics in Asia, it is Christopher Buckley. And so, my fellow Americans, it's something of a cliche now that politicians are so ridiculous, it's becoming more and more difficult for political humorists to compete. I mean, how do you top this declaration from our president, Bill Clinton? He said, this is still the greatest country in the world if we just steal our wills and lose our minds. <laughs> Representative John Kasich, who has set up an exploratory committee as a candidate for the presidency, I think he's still running. He said, we as Republicans need to start rowing with one oar. And one senator is reported to have complained, why can't the Jews and the Arabs just sit down together and settle this like good Christians? <laughs> I'm getting laughs and I haven't even resorted to taking cheap shots at Dan Quayle, but here goes, since I'm on a roll. Um, this is from the man who was just one heartbeat away from being our president, he said, in explaining the difference between the Houses of Congress. Uh, there are lots more people in the House. I don't know how many, I never counted, but at least a couple of hundred. 
I know it's a real challenge, but tonight's panelists have all risen to that challenge again and again, and they continue to skewer politicians and bureaucrats, in other words, the, our nation's beloved leaders. And I would like to bring this truly glittering group out for you. We'll start off with Bruce McCall, who wears the most hats here. He is a humorist, columnist, an illustrator of note, an expert on two countries, the United States and his native Canada. His memoir, Growing Up Bored in Canada, Thin Ice, Saved by the American Dream, is now available in paperback, as is his collaboration with Lee Eisenberg, Viagra Nation, the definitive guide to life in the new sexual utopia. I'm not going to touch that one with a 10-inch pole. His, <laughs> his humorous commentaries on our culture are a regular feature in The New Yorker, and his thoughts on political matters can be found on the op-ed page of the Los Angeles Times. Steve Martin has called Bruce one of his favorite humorists. I think it's the name that first came to mind when he was asked. So I'm very pleased that Bruce McCall could be with us. Kay Clinton writes monthly columns for The Progressive and The Advocate, and her book, Don't Get Me Started, will be released in paperback in January. But it is as a performer that most people know her. She's done a lot of stand-up, five comedy records. In fact, she brought her latest for me tonight. Recently, she was off Off-Broadway in her one-woman show, Correct Me If I'm Right, which the New York Times reviewer loved, and I think pretty much everybody who uh, saw it. Kate has been on Comedy Central, Good Morning America, dozens, maybe even thousands of other TV shows, including the one hosted by her former boss, Rosie O'Donnell. Admirers among her peers include Ellen DeGeneres, Paul Rudnick, Melissa Etheridge, at least the, they're the people who gave her the, the blurbs on her book. Kate Clinton. Calvin Trillin is probably best known for his Americana and true crime stories in The New Yorker, or maybe for his fabulous food reportage, or the bestsellers like Remembering Denny. Theatergoers will remember the two one-man shows, but for me, his real claim to fame is all of those appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Bud's been writing witty things about politics and politicians for a long time now. There's even a collection of his political verse, Deadline Poet, or My Life as a Doggerel. <laughs> his most recent book is Family Man, just out in paperback, and I think we can all agree with one critic's assessment, Calvin Trillin is a national treasure. Calvin Trillin. <laughs> And then there's Gail Collins. She's on the editorial board of the New York Times, which would normally make me suspicious of her ability to write a funny line, but now that she's also become a regular on the Times op-ed page, we all know that she's doing quite a good job at screwing politicians and their ilk. Her very hilarious book about the role of rumor in Washington, also just out in paperback. All of these people have books that were in hardcover a year ago and now are out in paperback. Her book is called Scorpion Tongues, Gossip, Celebrity, and American Politics. And in it, we learn that the campaign of one presidential candidate, John Fremont, was destroyed by rumors that he was illegitimate, a cannibal, and a Roman Catholic. And it was <laughs> the last charge that did all the damage. Gail Collins. So do you ever ask yourself that question, can I top a politician's idiotic remarks? Well, actually, Fremont also was accused of uh, stealing uh, little Protestant kids and using their blood to make matzahs. <laughs> Wasn't he? But that was true. I, th I think that was true, yes. Mm. They were good. Truth is, <laughs> you, you tasted a few of them. <laughs> Truth is a defense, that's what it was. Are, are some politicians easier targets than others, do you think? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Everybody that's running this year is a good target, I would say. This is the best year ever. I'm so happy to be here today and be doing this year and this campaign in which so many wonderful things are happening and Donald Trump and Jesse Ventura are running for president. And it's but Dan Quayle dropped out. I know, that was hard. But <laughs> <laughs> I think Dan Quayle sort of used up. As, uh, in fact, I thought he was sort of used up by the time he got elected, because the campaign, <laughs> I mean, my, my kids were bringing home quail jokes 
from, from school. It was like knock-knock jokes. They were really sort of, <laughs> I mean, you felt you couldn't take money for doing something that the bartender gave away with the peanuts. And, um, <laughs> and the other thing about Quayle that I think is not true of some of these people, he had a really ferociously loyal group of fans. And uh, I try not to mention him much because I, I did think he was sort of a cliche. Um, but uh, one time I wrote a column uh, suggesting, without mentioning any names, that uh, we pass a, um, an amendment to the Constitution making a C average a requirement for the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> I got a tremendous amount of mail from the Quail people. So <laughs> the um, I miss Marilyn. Marilyn, I miss her. I miss doing that thing where you look at her and hope that it's really Lily Tomlin. In there. <laughs> right. no, just right. Still That's searching right. for signs of intelligent life. <laughs> Don't look over here, dear. But I guess he's uh, left and he's uh, now spokesperson for Cliff Notes, which is good. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> people overlook, you can be too parochial. Dear leader, give John Eels. Speak, yeah. yeah. Just pull it closer to your mouth. In Canada, they talk far from their mics. <laughs> there's, a, there's a parochialism afoot when, when we only talk about American politicians, because my favorite uh, politician is, is Kim Jong-il of North Korea, very un undercovered in this country. And I just want to put in a plug for him. A anything funny? The little guy he, needs it. <laughs> would this, would this be said? the dear leader or the no, beloved son of the dear leader? That was his father. Yeah. He's dead. He's dead, but yeah. he just got elected dear leader. <laughs> Well, Canada is not exempt. Uh, the premier of uh, Ontario once, William Davis, explained why his female education minister's salary was being cut by 35%. He said, we'd like to pay her the same as the men get, but times are tough. <laughs> <laughs> I left long, long before that. <laughs> do you, but do you, because you come from another country, do you think that you have a, a more objective view of American politics, or have you been here long enough so that? Do you have a green card? I can't <laughs> vote. <laughs> no, yes, I do, but I okay. so I can't vote. So, so. Uh, yeah, I think, I, think I have. A, you know, we, the Canadians are their favorite subject is American baiting and hating and yeah. stuff. So I don't. I don't like to brag here, but I actually set the um, the record for consecutive columns on a Canadian subject by American <laughs> columnists. Uh, uh, two. two? Right. <laughs> uh, that was some years ago, and it still stands. Well, you're I very, still you're very prolix. <laughs> right. I still remember all my Margaret Trudeau jokes. Yeah. People oh, don't remember yeah. her anymore. Whatever no. happened to Margaret Trudeau? She's a housewife in Ottawa, I believe. She Crazy <laughs> housewife. <but> <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if we talk about first ladies in this country being kind of wild, she was about as wild as it gets. No. A great embarrassment to her husband, Pierre Trudeau, who was a bit of an embarrassment in his own right, wasn't he? Well, so uh, do you think that certain people are almost guaranteed to misspeak or say something particularly foolish, like the Bush's father and son, or Bob Dornan, or Bob Dole? Hey, all of these people are Republicans, aren't they? What does this mean? Well, you know, Al Gore, you've got to give Al Gore some credit in there, yeah. too. I mean, Al Gore walks in and something is going to be said, something. But he's if so he, nervous about being boring. And you, and you, that's right. You never actually know. He, he may not speak at all. I w remember when those, <laughs> in 92, when, when they had those, uh, that series of announcements about cabinet secretaries and things in, in Little Rock, and Gore just stood right behind um, Clinton, I refer to him in a poem as, as a man-like object. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Al Gore once I think they're on drugs. Should we? I think they're on drugs. All of them. I think they have to be to do the schedule that they do. I mean, I think we should probably drug test them. <laughs> um, they actually did tr d drug test Dan Quayle, and they found traces of formaldehyde. <laughs> which was <laughs> actually, I, I've noticed that that you have the most respect for it for one of the presidential candidates when he pulls out. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I we mean, like I think so part of it's just though. relief. Part of it's saying, well, I don't have to worry about that turkey running the country. <laughs> but part of it is, it's really sensible. Why would, it, why, why would a sane person do that? And, and so the person has shown some rational behavior. And I, I sort of have a glow on today about, about Elizabeth Dole, I think. <laughs> um, she's a little warmer human being than we really thought. 
But the press also loves the people who don't have a chance, like McCain in this one, Bruce Babbitt in Bruce a previous Babbitt. election. Paul Zongas was yeah. very good that way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that McCain can. doesn't have a chance if something happens to, uh, to George Bush. It could um, not happen. All the Republicans who run the Republicans would well, have to shoot themselves true. to that's let probably John McCain true. Yeah. be the nominee. I think. Promise. <laughs> Can I just throw out a, an Al Goreism? He actually said, a zebra cannot change its spots. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so true. Something that, about that's when you think <laughs> about that, that's true. <laughs> no, see, he's, he's, he's a lot more zen than, yes. than people <laughs> think of. And when, you, and when you think of it, that's one of those things that if some Chinese guy would have said, oh, we bask in refraction of your wisdom. <laughs> but, but the fact that Al Gore said it in a kind of a jlubby way, you think that the, he was making a mistake, but he wasn't. He meant to say that. <laughs> well, I find it very strange that during this campaign, we who have been watching it, the three or four of us, are, are arguing about the different types of boredom, like sort of different kinds of cheese you might have or something, you know? And, Bill Bradley is at least as boring as Al Gore, if you listen to him, but he was a nit for all that time, you know, and people who are professional basketball players, they could just walk around. And also, he doesn't seem to have that sort of teleprompter six inches from his eyes the way Gore does. He actually seems to be saying something that he's thought of himself, whether it's, whether it's very scintillating or not, but, but he doesn't. Well, he doesn't really care whether you're interested in what he's saying or not. He used right. to be a Nick, you know? I mean, right. he is serious. Well, he like also I've, I've interviewed him, the by the way. Yeah. I've interviewed you, you him, and I have to tell you, it was a really dis disconcerting experience because he does not believe in, in any kind of exchange. He talks at you, and mm -hmm. after, and, and he will not allow you to talk during that point, and then he right. finally finishes, and then you're allowed to say something, <laughs> and then he talks and he, at he's you. he's by that time, he got up and walked out of the studio, right? <laughs> you're not, not even there. back from lunch. They all, do that? they all do that. Some of them play at exchange. I think my, I think my problem with him, I wrote a column hmm. some years ago about him, is I think he may be too tall, because, <laughs> uh, I mean, we're, we're in a position here where we're, we're the only superpower left, and I actually thought that, you know, in those airports in Europe where they say, European community, others. I think there should be another line, only remaining superpower. <laughs> um, but, but we're, and, and so we try to pretend we're not gonna bully anybody as we bully people. And, and so here's this, these tiny little guys from Central America or the Japanese prime minister come in. There's this huge guy <laughs> looking down at him like that. Um, I think he's gonna have to do something about the height. Uh, <laughs> It's not just an IQ thing now. We have to have presidents no taller than, how tall is Clinton? Six, six, one? So no. Clinton is six, well, you saw that thing, um, <laughs> you saw that thing where Donald Trump said he took a short picture, but he was six, three, something like that. <laughs> um, it was very eerie, because I had done a column about, about Ron Perlman's waist. You know, <laughs> the, Ron Perlman, who doesn't usually talk to the press, had called in the New York Times for an interview but when you looked at the interview very carefully, he didn't exactly answer any questions. The only kind of clear quote in it was, um, I take a fat picture, but I actually have a 28-inch waist. <laughs> and so I, I wrote a column about, about some guy who, who tries to measure his waist, because he just can't believe that little butterball. He's got more than a thing. <laughs> and, and of course, get, gets cut in half by Perlman's security guards with, with security. <laughs> but, uh, he was also going to measure his instep. Uh, I mean, I mean, his, his inseam. Is, is that what you call that? Inseam. In 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 instep is, in the, is the foot. Yeah. In joke. Yeah. In joke. Yeah. Right. And and uh, in case Perlman said, uh, um, actually, I'm get those pictures with all those leggy women and everything, but actually, I'm five foot eleven and a half inches tall. Uh, and then about the next day. Donald Trump actually said that. Uh, I photograph I, short. Right? Yeah, photograph you. short. That's right. <laughs> I said, well, I photograph a little bald. I'm actually, um, <laughs> actually, my hair is almost exactly like Ted Koppel's hair. <laughs> um, but in photographs, it doesn't show up. Well, Donald Trump has that sort of like a whip topping hair kind of. Yeah, moose. and you know, Mark it's Singer. It's kind of a his, blonde moose. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Singer in, in the in the New Yorker. Profile actually actually interviewed the barber. There's no there's no doubt. There's some some uh, <laughs> rug work there. Uh, I mean, they got about ten Afghani guys there. The ones who make the rugs <laughs> and then you know, the kill them things and everything. They got a lot of stuff. <laughs> I went a good wind. 
<laughs> the helicopter, he'll never, he'll never make it through the, if he's elected through that helicopter no. when no. they duck into that helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> boom, it's going to be gone. Well, Giuliani has that problem, you know. It's, uh, like he's been changing, though. He's been sort of working it back little by little by little by little. By little. The comb over. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, his whole <laughs> hair is sort of, every year sort of it gets a little bit farther back. He's, he's breaking us in, really. Yeah, he's preparing. not going to do the list either after a while. <laughs> no, he's very, he's changing quietly for the campaign. <laughs> What strange disease makes all Southern Republicans wear wigs? He's a foreigner. We're not going to give him a mic. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what strange disease makes most Southern Republican uh, eminences in the Senate and Congress wear ludicrous wigs? It's like no. sports casters. Are you thinking Everyone of Strom Thurmond? Is that what you're wigs. You're this, hinting um, about Nobody yeah. ever says anything about it. They're always well, I no, do. Dave Barry had that great column about Strom Thurmond where, where he said what he said, and I guess it was the Nita Hill thing that was just gibberish, and then he translated and says, why is it that my hair is the color of tang? <laughs> <laughs> Many of the most foolish things uh, that we read about are just malaprops and misspoken comments. Uh, and we shouldn't pick on people like Dan Quayle when he says something like, Desert Storm was a stirring victory for the forces of aggression and lawlessness, <laughs> because we know he meant a victory against those things. Right. He just said it wrong. Well, except see, once you get stuck, once you get stuck, uh, uh, it's the same way that Gore, Gore actually, I think we've forgotten this, at one point in about 1993 or four, had sort of lost the stiff thing because he was making some good jokes about it that mm -hmm. unfortunately he told the same jokes again and again <laughs> and again and, and now we're, he's back where he started but um, uh, quail you can't really do self-deprecating jokes about being dumb mm -hmm. I mean it doesn't really work <laughs> and and so quail I think got stuck with a lot of I, I, I think I think we stick them with, with whatever um, their reputation is so that if someone else put a knee on potato, I mean, say if, if Clinton put a knee on potato, you know that whatever other problems he has, he's very smart, so we think that was a little error, but with Quayle, we think it's characteristic. Yeah, but of Clinton we didn't say, and Dan Quayle did, it isn't pollution that's harming our environment, it's the impurities in our air and water that are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> he also said, and this one has been quoted quite a bit, I believe we are on an irreversible trend toward more freedom and democracy but that could change. <laughs> Those are the good old days. I mean, he was special. That's, that's well, much you know, better than a, an E on potato. He hit a truth squad this last time he was running, whose entire point was to denounce false Dan Quayleism. Uh -huh. So they would call you up and say, he didn't say the one about not being able to speak Latin, so he couldn't go to Latin America. <laughs> okay, he did say right. the one about the no mind is a terrible thing to lose or <laughs> right. whatever it was. That yeah. one was true. But they were, they were upset about it. He wanted to get the record straight. So you, yeah. the interesting headline denies saying <laughs> Latin <laughs> or Latin America. Right. Or but no longer believes that no Latin longer is spoken. Right. In some cases, Upon I'm sure they just are nervous. Changes position on Latin <laughs> being Latin America. <laughs> I'm sure they're just nervous. These people have to talk an awful lot off the tops of their Absolutely. heads. Absolutely. And so when Ronald Reagan met Samuel Doe, the, the late dictator of, of uh, Liberia, and he it addressed him as Chairman Mo, you know, he was just, <laughs> just nervous. Oh, no, that's not, that, well, Reagan's problem was not, went way beyond that. I mean, as, as you know, this, this book apparently says that he went to his uh, son's high school graduation and didn't recognize him, didn't recognize his son. And, and there was a great thing when, when um, he went to a, um, a reception for big city mayors. This was very early in his, in his administration. And um, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Samuel Pierce, was there. And he came up to him and, and, and he said, uh, hello, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> how, are, how are things in your city? And I tried to figure out what would he say? I mean, what was the reply? <laughs> You know, good. kind of straight good. You know, or <laughs> you know, the the president doesn't recognize his own cabinet officers, but pothole problems being cleared up, and uh, or or sort of pretend it was sort of a joke, like, uh, oh, hello, count. Um, <laughs> um, how's the countess? How are things at, at the uh, at the castle? Uh, Kate has 
Having that last name, Clinton, been a help or a hindrance since 1992? It's been lovely. I actually do have a brother named Bill. Uh -huh. <laughs> Are you any relation to the neighborhood? The na <laughs> <laughs> or I Clinton mean, upstate Corners, New York. upstate? Upstate New York, yeah. But, and I, I uh, just met the president a couple of weeks ago, and I said, hey, I, my last name's Clinton. And he, goes, he said, oh, family. And then I well, said, not, oh, that not exactly. I got, <laughs> it's a, a big country. And then I said, uh, and I have a brother named Bill. And then he, we laughed, and he did a speech, and he was working his way back on the line. And he looked, he said to me, I hope your brother didn't take a lot of crap for the name. And, <laughs> and I said, no, we've actually upgraded on airlines because of it. <laughs> 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 what was the occasion of your meeting, Kate? It was, well, thank you for asking. Um, it was, uh, you told me to ask before okay. we came up. <laughs> <laughs> I expected just a little quicker. Right. Um, the uh, Empire State Pride Agenda Dinner uh, was in one of the larger hotels here. Was Pride the Agenda? Race. Pride Agenda. It was what does the, that mean? Uh, lesbian, and gay, lesbian and Gay Pride Agenda Dinner. And he came and um, we were excited. He's mending his, his gay Well, it's actually defenses. the first president who could say lesbian and gay without spitting up. <laughs> <laughs> and we were kind of proud of that. And uh, yes, he was uh, thanking us for his support. Mm -hmm. Of course, at that dinner, he, he asked the people at the door, don't ask, don't tell. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, you know, they, they, yes, they backed up on a few things. They backed up on health care. They backed up on gays in the military. Uh, they backed up on a lot. And I think maybe their theme song should be <laughs> indicating a backing up sound. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enjoy the veal. Good night. Well, Kate, <laughs> Now she'll do a basset hound at bay, <laughs> right? I'm excited about having a pres possibly having a president with a great outside shot. You can't really say that about right. Bradley. It would be great. He goes to the basket well. Uh -huh. I'd be excited. Lousy jump shot. Yeah. Mm. But they were very short shorts then. Yeah. Which I think is sad. <laughs> <laughs> you, during the Lewinsky scandal, you were on television an awful lot. Do you, do you think the news people wanted to have some comic relief or wasn't the whole thing a bit of a comic relief well it was um pretty comical why do you but think they serious. wanted you um i'm charming and uh <laughs> good look looking better looking, looking than yeah. better looking than daniel shore better looking than she does shore. a fantastic imitation of a truck in reverse yes thank you <laughs> um, this and that was part was of the whole thing right? yeah that was Maybe like I built up to, to that, really. Uh, it's the keystone of the whole show, the backing up sound. Um, you know, I, I think it was my job to just point out that it was uh, wonderful that Bill and Monica were having sex in the White House. Um, because, I mean, I was more worried that they'd be working on problems together. <laughs> right. you know, Foreign policy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like. Right. <laughs> so. I was happy that they were, <laughs> if they were. I know that was really what was really what was really frightening was the cover story. I mean, yeah, they were just meeting to kind of talk about Education. which way to go in Asia or I something know. like that. Right? <laughs> Monica uh, was like, "Is Iraq the past tense of Iran?" Right. <laughs> 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 <You know. laughs> You didn't believe that stuff about Nancy Reagan and Frank Sinatra in the White House, right? <laughs> I, she, you know, she was. She always seemed so lifelike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of lifelike. Sort of lifelike. <laughs> and I didn't know that Reagan was Dutch. This is a shock to me. Um, Half. I thought he was American. <laughs> um, oh. So, Bruce, when you're writing an op-ed piece, what gets you going? Is it some little tidbit in the news, or do you try to focus the on the shimmering big mirage of money off the horizon? <laughs> <laughs> um, it just it's, it's off the cuff. I don't have to write political humor all the time, so I only take the shots when they're cheap and quick, <laughs> <laughs> and they come fairly naturally to everybody. Just the trick is to find a different twist, or try to find an original way of taking on a subject like Monica Lewinsky, which is almost impossible. Um, but I, you know, I found I did a thing in the New Yorker last year where instead of d dealing with her, it was about Clinton being forced to accept Starr's redesign of the Oval Office, which had a permanent perimeter around it, and he had to wear a jumpsuit with no zippers. 
and, uh, <laughs> had portholes in the windows the, the uh, FBI could watch him. And she was there behind him with a cattle prod and so on. That was, <laughs> that was my Monica Lewinsky joke. It was the, sort of a shaggy dog story. Well, as you point out, it's hard to tell jokes about Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton when everybody in America is yeah. telling jokes. I mean, I remember the, the ones in the office like, why does Clinton wear flannel underwear to keep his ankles warm in the wintertime? <laughs> jokes like that. Uh, they, they were just, everyone was doing a can you top this at the same time as they were saying, it's terrible what they're doing to the president. You know, um, oh, I, he should be allowed to do whatever he wants, and then they tell you the joke. I told you backstage that the only good one I heard was was why why did it take so long to um, identify the stain on the dress? And it's because everybody in Arkansas has the same DNA. <laughs> but um, but um, I'm 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 from Missouri, which is the world capital of Arkansas jokes, and we were very pleased to hear that one. Uh, but, I, but I did hear, I was wrong because I heard another one, which is, what do you call eight straight days of oral sex? And that's Hanukkah Blowinsky. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not sexual relations, according to the you president. <laughs> no, it's just This Hanukkah. is why boring is good. This is right. why Bradley being boring and Gore being boring is a relief. Right. I mean, the more boring they can be, and the Bush happier was I am. A, Bush was terrible for, I mean, the elder Bush was, <laughs> was awful, awful for us. I mean, it would, I, uh, those, those cabinet uh, political cartoonists, I think, actually found that, that they looked, the cabinet secretaries looked so much alike, you couldn't tell, you know, it, it was supposed to be uh, the Secretary of State was actually the Attorney General. They were all mm -hmm. these sort of I refer to as Protestants in suits, and um, the only the only person th we, we, that's why there was so much uh, attention to John Sununu. Mm. I mean, you you f you forgot who is the chief of staff now. You couldn't even name him. Go ahead, try. You can't see. I can't. Uh, can you? <laughs> can you, Gail? You work I for might, the New York but Times. I won't. That's she mean. doesn't want to show off. But, <laughs> but it's not Mike McClarty. No. It's, uh, huh? Oh, it's no, three Attorney, back. Thank you. Erskine oh, yeah. Bowles gone too. Oh, Erskine God, Bowles yeah. is gone, and if you're if you're trying a Sherman Adams, you're way off. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, no, it, you but, forgot, but he so still has the Vacuna coat. Was it, after was all that the, 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 oh no, I loved it when Larry yeah. speaks with spokesmen. Yeah. Yeah, that was. You know, that was easy for us. But I'm not Sununu, sure about that boredom stuff, though, but go on. No. Well, Sununu also was very clean. I mean, the, the Bush administration, whatever else you might say about it, uh, compared, say, to the Reagan administration, it's usually thought of as sort of the third term of the Reagan administration, but um, nobody was forced out. The Reagan administration, Time magazine once had about a four-page spread <laughs> of little mug shots <laughs> of people who had left either under a cloud or indicted or something. It looked like those ads that the insurance companies take for <laughs> leading salesmen of the tri-state area or something. It was just <laughs> hundreds, hundreds of them. And I mean, one guy kind of had come and gone and been indicted. I had never even heard of him. It was so fast. Uh, but that wasn't true in, in, in the Bush administration. It was very clean. And we were left basically with Sununu, because Sununu had everything that that reporters and, and commentators and jackals of the press um, love. Mainly, he was funny looking and he was self important and he was more interested in being the smartest person in the room. He had sort of a funny Grant. name, too. And he had a funny name. And he was, I think, Which Ed inspired Rollins. inspired you to verse. It did. Yeah. But Ed Rollins said of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of him, uh, He's a lesson in the perils of telling your child that he has a high IQ. <laughs> and, and, and so we loved him, and he did inspire. I think I'm probably the only poet ever who was inspired to poetry by John Sununu, uh, because I, I did. I loved I can't do the poem, but, but, I, but it came from his name, which I thought was a beautiful name. And uh, I eventually, the name kept running through my head, and I eventually uh, it was the first poem I did for the nation. It was called "If You Knew What Sanu Knew." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's why quail was so important because Bush was so nothing until he started the campaigning. Well, that's right. Remember we did have quail. That was, so everything. Forget everything I said. We had quail. But Bush, <laughs> but Bush right. also misspoke a lot. It didn't hurt him right. because we kind of knew what he was trying to say, even. 
if he couldn't get a complete sentence. Also, down. we didn't use nouns, which is a fantastic advantage. He didn't yes. count. Uh, didn't use nouns. Well, and I, I he spoke he spoke English sort of the way I speak French, which I don't do verbs uh. in French. I just don't do them. I just don't, and I find it a lot easier. He didn't. When I when he left, I wrote a poem about him, George Bush, which was. Uh, Farewell to you, George Herbert Walker, though never treasured as a talker. <laughs> your predicates were often prone to wander nounless off alone. <laughs> um, you did your best in your own way, the way of Greenwich Country Day. <laughs> so just relax and take your ease and never order Japanese. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, Gail, I thought a little poetry would sort of <laughs> I like that. I class up that. the place a little I bit. I taped that whole incident of the throwing up. You have it on it. Yeah, do, do you run it backwards I so do. to throw so it it's up? Like <laughs> 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 Boy, Kate. Come on over. <laughs> it can start When's a party. the next showing? <laughs> I so love Gail, that. The, the Japanese <laughs> guy goes, <laughs> 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 no, he was, th and there he was, face down in the Japanese prime minister's lap, talking right. about jobs, jobs, jobs. He's saying, close, 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 Gail, you've never written in verse for the Times. Would they allow it? Um, we talked about it at one point, but the moment passed, I think, wisely. <laughs> um, during the Clinton thing, my my usefulness, I was on the editorial board then, was basically that I'd done this book on history of gossip. And so, although nothing that happened, the Clinton thing had never happened before, each little piece of it had happened before somewhere along the line. So if we got really desperate and needed to write something and no one could think of anything tasteful to write, our editor would always say, well, Gail, could you do something about Grover Cleveland for <laughs> us again? You know, And Grover Cleveland just made me all the way through the Clinton thing. Well, it was interesting to note that uh, the sex scandals have, over the past, Thomas Jefferson, Grover Cleveland, uh, Woodrow Wilson, J John F. Kennedy. Franklin Pierce. Uh, Franklin Pierce, no, a great one, one of my favorites. Yeah, but he's not a Democrat. Is that true? I just point here. brought up his name because he <laughs> gets spoken of so rarely. Oh, he was, <laughs> was terrible, and they named this college for him in New Hampshire. I could never understand that. Well, what Pierce is such a good name do, for a guy Gail? with sex yeah. scandals. What did well, he do? He was, tell, you could tell us. <laughs> You could tell us. We won't tell you why. He, he had a drinking problem, and yeah. then he, he and didn't seem to like his wife that much, so he, she kept dragging him sort of back to New Hampshire, and then he kept kind of running away, and he ran off to the war and was named a general instantly during the Mexican War, but then developed this very unfortunate habit whenever there was a real fight of fainting and falling off of his horse. So they called him the fainting general, and then... The opposition said he was always said the vet, the veteran of many a hard fought bottle was the kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the high point for Franklin Pierce. It was downhill after that. Really. So there's always been political humor, mm -hmm. and but the difference is politicians in the old days seem to speak better than they do today. I don't or is think it they just were no, well no. covered? They weren't as well covered. That's uh, all. Radio. Or you know, I mean, you get up the next morning and it's all on your email. You know, and they, they gave a speech. It. They gave a speech once a week or something yeah. like that. And and that these guys have 30 speeches a day, and they're all, as you say, on their email and and instantly transform everybody. Uh, I don't think the old, the other guys spoke. spoke well, early on, there was just that. If a reporter showed up to cover a speech in the early 19th century, it was the, Helen the, Thomas. They go. It probably right. was. <laughs> <laughs> But they'd run away. Nobody would conceivably give a speech when there was actually a reporter there. And although people like George Washington were constantly, constantly saying, why do the reporters keep talking about scandal and don't come and cover our debates in the Senate and the House? If a reporter actually showed up and tried to write down what they said, he was evicted or sent to jail. I mean, they wouldn't have thought of letting you write down what they really said. That was, it was sort do of Do you like, have any sex yeah. stuff on George Washington? Some. Because uh, I'd like no. to hear, particularly if it has to do with those wooden teeth. <laughs> No. It involves splinters. No. What? Splinters. Splinters. <laughs> you know, I think the real problem was... <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> you can only imagine I think what you'll that have leads to. Leave. to. <laughs> the no. problem with George Washington oh, was that everybody thought he was dumb. You know, it was sort of like a Dan Quayle moment, and they were always sort of spreading rumors that he'd been seen shopping and that he couldn't count his change, or, you know, you got a letter from him and he misspelled everything, stuff like that. And he didn't know what the... Uh, that barcode thing was all about. <laughs> 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 so, 
So to some degree, the, the humor is also about how they are not like the rest of us, that they're out of touch because they're politicians. And there's a certain truth to that, isn't there? Um, sometimes with some of them. There's a, and, and they do weird stuff, you know, and they make wait, up wait, stuff wait, about I just don't have to stop. Sexism. She got the smallest amount of water. But and there's Lillian. none left now, too. Maybe one of the men would like to share with you. So I'm sorry, I interrupted <laughs> you. You were saying that uh, this whole business to about being Dole. out of touch. <laughs> <laughs> Where is she now? I'm sorry. Um, I, yeah, they, and they always said they they said things about each other. You know, you go back and you look at these things about you know, oh, he you know he fed Holy Communion to a dog. That was one of my favorite ones. That was Thaddeus Stevens said that about somebody or. He drank from a skull, you know, drank wine from a skull, or the cannibalism one I thought was very creative. Stuff like that, <laughs> you know, you don't get that anymore, really. No, instead we get people like Jesse Helms saying that democracy used to be a good thing, but now it's gotten into the wrong hands. <laughs> <laughs> I think Th something like that really reveals something about the person, don't you think? The uh, hurricanes in North Carolina. You know, when gay people met in Florida at Disney World, Gay Day, and Disney oh World yeah, was that's raining. right. Yes, oh, sorry. When uh, gay people met in Florida, gay people met in Florida. Um, <laughs> what kind of gay? people met they in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> gray people uh, um. met in Florida, and uh, Jesse Helms said that all the rain in Florida was caused by that. And now. No, 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 it was, it was Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson? Yeah. Pat Robert, no, no. Oh, uh, to, dear. To get the your fact your checkers your here. <laughs> okay. I was sent here. He to works for the New Yorker. They said that anything, anything that Kate said, uh, should be checked for accuracy. <laughs> um, Disney had uh, allowed a kind of gay day at Disney World, and and Pat Robertson said that God was going to send um, hurricanes uh, so. to 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 uh, Orlando, uh, and and he probably will someday. Yeah. Uh, he hasn't right now. But the hurricanes oh, in North Carolina. Let me give you some water please. here. Okay. <laughs> this might help. The hurricanes in North Carolina, I think, might have been caused by Jesse Helms and the nuclear arms. Is he gay? Yes. <laughs> We're not happy about it. Kate, what was All your reaction? All that stuff about what good shape they keep themselves in. That's how... <laughs> I guess that, that, that negates no that, looker. doesn't it? No, he's no looker, right. A lot of conservative Republicans have gay family members. Newt Gingrich's sister or half-sister is a lesbian. Recently I read about a guy in California whose son um, has uh, written a political oh, comment. Oh, the state oh, senator. Yeah. 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 state senator. His father is, has uh, introduced an anti-gay bill and his son is gay. And actually, the father Newt says he doesn't understand me. Newt Gingrich <laughs> actually said that he wouldn't come to his half-sister's wedding if she got married at a gay wedding, even though she isn't going to have a gay wedding and she hasn't invited him. Right. And um, um, I, I wrote a column about that said, I thought I was against gay marriage, at least gay Jewish marriage, because one of the best parts of a Jewish marriage ceremony is where the guy stomps on the glass. And if you have two guys um, who stomps on the glass, and it's a terrible, you can see them kind of elbowing each other out of the way, you know, trying to, ah, it's only stuff on the glass, and there's no way to start a marriage. And, um, but, but then I went to a, um, a, um, a heterosexual uh, Jewish wedding in, in Chicago. It was one of, one of those weddings where they do a lot of stuff and then explain what they're doing, what I call a demo wedding. <laughs> you know, and um, it's very saying, you know, now, now we're going to go under the chuppah, which town, you know, that sort of thing. And, and, um, and they both stomped on glasses. So now I've withdrawn my objection. Um, it's okay with me now. Uh, Match glasses. Ma yeah, exactly. Well, I think it's wonderful that this, you know, I think it's great that people have gay children who are speaking up and saying that, you know, being completely hypocritical. I love the Defense of Marriage Act, which, I mean, if you want to, def if you want to defend marriage, I think you should bring the uh, Bureau of Alcohol to 
back on firearms in to really Well, you right. know, the Defense of Marriage it. Act was most strongly defended by Bob Barr, who has been married three times. Yes. Uh, so it's right. really the who defense was also of the guy who got caught licking the whipped cream off the women's breasts at the leukemia fundraiser. <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. This is all absolutely true. Man, he's a former... It was for a good cause, <laughs> Gail. <laughs> uh, I mean... All right. I was doing... Gail is lactose intolerant. <laughs> <laughs> so what gets you going on writing uh, an op-ed piece? Oh, and terror, when do you know yeah. it's going to be funny? Never. I just know it's going to be done by <laughs> 7 o'clock at night. <laughs> and we just hope for the best you know, every day. The best day I've had since I was a columnist, um, which has not been very long at the Times although I've done this before elsewhere, uh, was the second or third week I was doing it, and I was sort of really struggling. And about 3 o'clock, I got this message from a friend of mine saying, I just heard that George Bush read a poem about the Alamo to the Ryder Cup golf team. And I thought, this is not possible. So I called the Bush headquarters, and they were very proud of it. And they sent me a copy. It was actually the letter that the guy who was about to die at the Alamo had, had, had written out saying, you know, we're all going to die, but it's OK. We're dying for a great and noble cause. Yeah, he's the guy who made the deal, too, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't really die. Right. But anyway, go ahead. That was George a good W. Column. Bush had, had yeah. called together the Ryder Cup team and had read the letter from the Alamo to them. And I can't conceive of what he's going to say for the Olympics. If <laughs> Well, but Gail, they went out and won after he, he read They that. did. Yeah. They went right out and won. As they were very, they the, were inspired. Uh, he they gets my right vote. <laughs> He's a, a lucky guy. That's the thing about George W. There's Bush. a great uh, story that Russell Baker used to tell about not being able to write a column uh, when he lived in the 50s here. And um, a copy boy used to come and collect his column at, I guess, 6 o'clock or something. And, and he always sat down after lunch and wrote the column. And then one day, this mechanism somehow failed. And he sat there and he looked at this blank paper. And he simply couldn't think of a column. And he, he thought, well, I'll take a walk. And he, and he went out his door and, and walked down the street next to a huge high rise. And out of maybe the 20th floor, a potato fell <laughs> uh, right at his feet on the, on the sidewalk, an obvious column. <laughs> and <laughs> And um, nobody knows, knows how the potato, some people thought that, that it just fell out the window. Uh, some people who have lived with columnists who can't think of a column think maybe his wife threw the potato. <laughs> <laughs> Get him going. Uh, and um, so I found that after I heard that story later, sometimes I would, wouldn't be able to think of a column. I'd say, well, I think I'll go out for a walk, um, maybe a potato. <laughs> uh, will fall, and, and my wife would say, Russell Baker's already written the potato falling <laughs> column. Right? Um, also, the village, I live in the village mainly low rise, uh, so you, it'd be unlikely you could find a potato falling uh, from any height. The most desperate case I ever saw was a long time ago when I was in Connecticut, and I was an editor of this chain of weeklies, and you know, one day all the little layouts with all the copy would come in from all the various weeklies, and one paper came in with a totally blank front page with <laughs> a note on the top saying, kids, draw a snowflake here and win a free copy of the Clinton Recorder. And it ran like that. I couldn't believe it. It was, I, uh, someday I'm going to do that for a column. <laughs> How could you see a snowflake on a white page? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I don't know the answer. Some editor. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. I want to remind you all that we're, we'll be taking your questions as well. If um, I hope you've written them down in cards, and I hope they're no logarithms, be soon. please. And I hope they're really funny too. And you'd better be funny, <laughs> or else we're not going to ask those questions. Uh, you, uh, Gail, there was a letter in today's Times from Geraldine Ferraro. She's very upset She's about not something happy you'd with written. Me, it's true, yeah. uh, had you intended it to be funny, or were you just being totally sexist, as she claims? Oh, I was being totally sexist. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> what was the incident? It was an anecdotal incident. It had to do with a very complicated story, which, although accurately, I did shorten down to an understandable list, uh, anecdote about um, when she was running for the Senate. And she had this thing where she would not separate herself from her husband's business. Oh, I yeah, could I never that, figure yeah. that out. You know, and, and she... Um, 
she kept, and, and then Liz Holtzman, you know, made a huge deal about the fact that her company that she was on with her husband had make, gotten like $350,000 from this pornographer, and she argued at one point that, that she had, they were trying to drive him out by raising the rents on him, which didn't, didn't really go over that well. That was the thing that was, she was objecting to, but. Well, have you, others, have all of you gotten complaints about jokes that you've told about politicians? I have politicians? really one that I have framed, which someday perhaps if this election goes really, really strangely will be worth billions of dollars. I have a framed thing that Donald Trump once <laughs> sent me. Um, it was a column I wrote about him years ago, and he circled my, my picture as I was at Newsday and hit a picture with a note saying, face of a dog, no wonder <laughs> you are so mean. And then later on down beneath, he misspelled the word two. And I felt that that, you know, it'd be a Dan Quayle-like thing someday. It'll be worth billions if he's president when the president misspelled it. It was T. He's a real oh, gent, yeah. isn't he? Yes, he's <laughs> lovely. Yeah. I can't wait <laughs> until he's president. <laughs> he's very quick to offense. I mean, I remember when they, it was a really funny piece about him about the, remember when he started the Mar Lago Club or something yeah, like that down in, in, uh, in Florida? In Florida, and, and there was a very funny piece on the back page of the Times, I can't remember who wrote it, about, uh, and it was from, um, uh, what was the name of that picture with Gloria Swanson and um, Sunset Boulevard? Sunset Boulevard, and, and there's nobody there except the loyal playing the, the German guy. and. Uh, uh, yeah, and he wrote he wrote the Times about about he had the second he had a bestseller for 14 weeks or something like that. And uh, one I saw once when when several years ago when he was involved in that basketball league, uh, somebody quoted him as saying that the that the rest of the owners are a bunch of schmucks, and he denied saying it, and said that he had never used the word schmuck in his life. <laughs> And I, I thought it showed tremendous restraint. You think a man could be in New York commercial real estate for 30 years <laughs> and never use the word schmuck? No. Um, he used the word putz head. <laughs> right. I it had, uh, was at some dinner and I had to introduce uh, Rudolph Giuliani. And his people called the, pro the event producers and they said that they didn't want me to introduce Giuliani because they had heard that I had referred to him as Adolf Giuliani, and uh, I had thought it, right, but, but you I didn't said say it. it. Yeah. I, I but did they knew, nevertheless, that you had thought it. Yes, <laughs> that's it's like I, don't even <laughs> think of parking here. I had uh, I had and referred to him a column once. I, w I was at the 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 um, master of ceremonies. I think it was the Episcopal Charities or some quite quite appropriate event for me, and. <laughs> They said, oh, the mayor's come. You have to introduce him. And I said, uh, well, I did call him in a column once, perhaps the only Italian-American in the greater New York area with no personal charm. <laughs> um, how would that be? He said, no, I don't. <laughs> um, he doesn't want you introducing him ever, period. Ever, okay. no. No. I want you to know that now. <laughs> In case you had any aspirations in that direction. <laughs> well, I, I did introduce him, uh, and then he did the speech, and people didn't hiss and boo. And as he was leaving, I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're surprised that it went this well. But we had to keep a group out um, called Gay Lib, which stood for Gays Against Lesbians, in, or Lomans Invading Barneys. <laughs> 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 Oh, there's an issue. Yeah, really, people were quite <laughs> upset. I thought that that um, concerning the recent unpleasantness at the Brooklyn Museum, that that if you're if you we really do get to a point where public officials uh, uh, decide uh, which piece of art they're offended by, uh, maybe the best person to do that would not be a public official who is deeply offended by jaywalking. Yes. Um, <laughs> Or a Republican um, by elephant right, dung. Right. <laughs> Bruce, you're an artist. Um, do you, you couldn't have been in the Sensation show. No, no. You, no, you no. don't do that kind of work. No, no, I'm very conservative that way. Do you ever do politics in your art? Yes, I did a thing on Giuliani. Giuliani's Dream of New York uh, for the New Yorker last, last year, which was not kind to him. Nobody, had, nobody said a peep. 
Nobody. I wonder why everybody goes after Rudy Giuliani and yet he is very popular. Maybe you're living in alternative universes. Who's he popular with? The, the, the people who vote. I, I think his, in fact, his ratings just went up right now and he's beating uh, Hillary Clinton by over 12 points in the latest poll. Nobody the tells polls, me anything. The polls are very strange. Right now a poll is, well, not probably for those two. It's the only race in the world where everybody at this point in the race knows who these two people are. The entire race is going to be decided by six people in Dobbs Ferry. They're the only people in the entire state who don't know who they're going to vote for right now. But normally, when you look at these presidential polls, you know, and you, how do you feel about Bradley versus Bush and nobody's, it's like asking people, what's your favorite poet, you know, and they sit there and then they say, well, Robert Frost is good. And then everyone says, well, what does this mean? Why did they pick Robert Frost and not, you know, E.E. E. Cummings? And it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just completely crazy that we're looking at these things right now. Well, I asked for some questions and I have to pass this one over to you, Bud, because you're not going to believe it unless you see it. Um, <laughs> Dr. Alexandra Sununu. <laughs> it's a business card. Read the other side. La Florida de Alonso Escobedo. At, and, and, well, it Read says, I'm John's sister. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> she printed it up specially for this. <laughs> and I'd love to hear your poem on the chief of staff. Thanks. Well, I, I can't recite it because it was a long time ago, but I will take this card and I'll send it to you. Actually, I was at the Republican National Convention in 96 and, and some young man walked up to me and said, I'm John Sununu. And he didn't look at all like John Sununu. And, um, and I thought it was a joke because I had been inspired by John Sununu, but it turned out it was John Sununu's son who is the nephew <laughs> of Dr. Alexandra Sununu, and I believe ran for Congress. I don't, I, I, I don't know if... He not only ran, but with my support, won. <laughs> and, and you did the slogan. I you? did the slogan, yes. which is so you do that. not as bad as the other one. <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, was it now, you do that voodoo? Well, the, no, Wasn't that uh, part of it? I oh, well. can't remember. Uh, Dr. Sununu, uh, are you, uh, uh, you can answer the question, did, was Ed Rollins uh, just picking that out, or did your parents, since you are the sister uh, of John Sununu, actually tell him early on that he had a high IQ, and were they right? They didn't know. They didn't know. So it's a canard. It's a canard. Thank you. Well, I'm glad we got that settled, buddy. <laughs> Let's move on. I'm going to send you this, and it's really, it's a nice poem. It's a nice card, too, isn't it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. You'll like it. This is from somebody who is either British Very or nice doesn't nephew, know how to spell the, the way, word humor, because it has a U in the, two U's in the humor. Mm. It says, there seems to be more political humor than ever before, but most of it seems a la Letterman. Why such a dearth of genuine political irony? I'm, I'm asking you, Gail, He's first. He's asking us? I'm wounded. You're an expert, Gail. You've written a book on this. <laughs> <laughs> They're always, well, you know, we actually were much funnier now than I think we were through most of our history. You know, the number of Warren Harding jokes were very, very few and far between. <laughs> uh, there was that one good one about Franklin Pierce, I admit that, but... Um, I don't think we're losing it. There's just more stuff out there today. You know, every, every problem that we have in America can be blamed on the fact that there's more technology and 27,000 cable channels. I think that that's fair. Well, Kate, when you were writing for Rosie O'Donnell, what percentage of the humor was political and what percentage was other stuff? Uh, uh, 0.5 uh, <laughs> percent was political. Is that Rosie, or is, do you think that's what She had a really wanna... clear idea who she wanted to talk to, and that was very middle America, very, she didn't, she didn't want to get near politics at all. She didn't, you know, it was not, it was like living in the land without irony. And it was just, she didn't want to go there. 
you know, she had a whole idea of she wanted to deal with get the kids. She wanted to talk to middle America that, you know, knew, that really kind of talked about celebrity and talked about entertainment. So, um, you know, I, I remember I was at some writer's meeting and they said, we need to write, um, we need 10 jokes on, um, who was the guy that was in that, he's in Baywatch now? Anybody? Hasselhoff? David, David Hasselhoff. Hasselhoff. Yeah. Thank you. She's but hit your buzzer. She's hooked on Baywatch. Hit your buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> She's so a Baywatch fanatic. I said, so <laughs> they said 10 jokes on David Hasselhoff, and I said, okay. And I went and I went to the meeting with 10 jokes on David Halberstam. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like... <laughs> <laughs> Could we hear a couple of those? <laughs> If I hear the Sununu poem, you can get one. But <laughs> so, I mean, that was the... Could we, you send some of the Halberstam jokes sure. to Dr. Alexandra we'll Sununu? <laughs> yeah. uh, Bruce, is there good political humor in Canada? I don't know. I, I don't live there. Uh, back to that other question. I, I think there is a dearth these days. I think the, the National Lampoon, where I cut my teeth 25 years ago, was was crude and and sort of nasty, but it was also deeply involved politically in the times, which were Nixon's and and, and Johnson's um, time, uh, before that. And without those kind of villains, I think it's very hard to be that funny. I think we've ran run into a rather bland time in terms of uh, disgusting leaders. Well, this uh, this question says that most of the humor is like Letterman. Yeah, uh, I and, agree. Uh, and and we. Every night, Jay Leno has his yeah. political jokes as well, but they, they really do. They don't have that edge. They just they, they almost sound mechanical at times, don't well, they? Also, you've got Saturday Night Live an hour and a half a week, and they never do political humor. They never have. They used to. Well, very sort of predictable. Did the stuff. imitations of the, of the yeah imitations, yeah. but not nothing with any bite. Nothing outside the United States, probably. And and bad as it was 30 years ago, you remember that that was the week that was. There was a weekly live show about what was going on. But that was a knockoff of the British show. Kind of, yes, of course, yeah. but that's not surprising. And the British have always done wonderful yes. political humor. The French have always done wonderful political humor. Yeah. Uh, that was a show that Gloria Steinem came to New York to write on. Gloria Steinem came to, to New York to write on. No, she was, was already here. She w okay. Uh, cause <laughs> Okay. Listen, How do you know I, this? I'm so happy to have been sent here tonight to just <laughs> keep track of this woman. She will go off and say things that are not true. Um, Gloria Steinem not only was already here, she'd already done the Playboy Bunny article, I think. All right. Yeah. And be, the reason I know is because I used to write for that show, and, and we tried to write something together. See? That didn't work out very All well. Right. Uh, I thought you went and to also it was Club not and, it. and and the show had a little problem which was called David Frost <laughs> um, which which I used to shudder when he had to read one of my lines I I um I thought he's the only um, only Englishman in show business who could sound condescending in a lower class accent <laughs> um, um, and, and he was sort of a sneerer rather than a, a comedian I thought some of the com uh, some of the English uh, comics on politics, particularly Peter Cook, may he rest in peace, mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. I just laughed when he walked on, uh, but, uh, and John Byrd, and, um, um, but even Flanders and Swan, remember them I when they used to Flanders be on Swan, the Ed yeah. Sullivan show? I remember once, uh, this is in the old days before Margaret Thatcher changed the conservative party, uh, they explained the British political system, they said, we come from Britain where there are two parties just like you have in the United States, we have we have the Labour Party, which you would call socialist, and we have the Conservative Party, which you would call socialist. <laughs> <laughs> but truly, except for that period in the 60s and early 70s when everybody was so engaged because first there was the war and then there was uh, Watergate, but it, I, was there any real wild, dry, witty humor about the Eisenhower administration? I mean, you know, was there? I, um, Mark Saul, Saul, I think, Saul. started right around yeah. then. And the checker speech. Well, that was true. That was good. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that dog now that we need? Yeah, but Mark Saul started it all, yeah. didn't he? And then Lenny Bruce came along and Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory. right? So. There was a moment when it really got but very clever and biting. But it was really only a moment, I think, that we were clever and biting. Mm. American history is not in clever I don't think Mark biting. Saul's sort of time in the sun lasted very long. No, and he changed. He's a Republican now, by the way. I didn't know he, that. He yeah. voted for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> what? 
There are some people who think we'll that's make a, a good idea. Here. Thank you. Uh, there seems to be more political humor. Oh, I read that one. Okay. Mr. Trillin, what is your memory of the greatest upset in American political history, the re-election of your neighbor Harry Truman as president? Was he your, your neighbor? Well, he, co he comes from the same county. <laughs> oh, That okay. makes him a neighbor, I guess. He comes from, uh, from Independence, and, and he worked in Kansas City. Yeah, we're, I think what we, we call in uh, around uh, Jackson County, Missouri, Lonsman. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, in, well, it was, a great, it was a great day for Missouri. And um, uh, Harry Truman, of course, the, the weird thing about Harry Truman is that um, people in Kansas City, when I was a, a boy, um, had a sort of a disdain for him. I mean, I, they said, well, he's just this Pendergast guy. And, um, and he also, they, they, they didn't like the fact that he couldn't run a haberdashery uh, store. And most people in Kansas City uh, in, the, in the late 40s, most grown-ups, I, I noticed when they spoke, talked about having bought a tie from Harry Truman when he had the store on 12th Street. And um, I wrote a column saying once that if everybody who said he bought a tie <laughs> from Harry Truman actually did buy a tie, um, it would have been a fantastically successful store. And Clifton Daniel would now be married to the daughter of the cravat king of Western Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I think we're lucky that it failed that store because mm -hmm. um, because uh, he is, of course. I, I actually, we went to the White House uh, this, I guess it was last summer, sort of ringers and something, we, somebody, and um, I told um, the president, I, said, I know you're not supposed to discuss politics in a time like this, but what in the hell is Harry Truman's picture doing kind of halfway up the stairs instead of, and he claimed that he was trying to get it back down, <laughs> uh, but you know how he is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't been back, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> and I probably never get back now. Well, to some degree, the whole Missouri thing is a city-country thing, don't you think? Uh, I'm reminded of another thing that Dan Quayle once said. Rural Americans are real Americans. There's no doubt about that. You can't always be sure with other Americans. Not all of them are real. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is true. I And I... <laughs> That's something that I think your problem with appreciate. these quotes, Lenny, is you just don't understand some of them. <laughs> you got to get on their level. You got on a higher level. Well, uh, if you've ever read one of those uh, books about um, regional uh, American regionalism, cultural regionalist America, which I know you haven't, or you wouldn't make so many mistakes. Um, <laughs> the the um, people say uh, that the Midwest and um, particularly the upper Midwest, is what people are talking about when they talk about something being real American, uh, so that people, like Midwesterners like me, are uh, real Americans or typical Americans or what New Yorkers will call out-of-towners. Um, do you think it has to do with the rectangular states? Hmm. It, the, the, yes. Um, Could you explain the rectangular states and why they won't allow the teaching of evolution in rectangular states. <laughs> I'm confused. In the first place, Kansas, you may think of rectangular as rectangular, but those guys who pass that actually think it's round. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, um, so sometimes when Easterners look at it, it looks rectangular. Um, I like those states. Um, the new state motto of Kansas, show me the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> and it, it used to be, we're where the staple is. Uh, but no. they've changed it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I often talk about, about the difference between state mottos on the license plates between the Midwest and the East. 
and I probably have talked about it at, at the 92nd Street Y, but because I, I had a kind of a study of it, so I figured that um, they're very modest in, in the Midwest compared to, remember New York was the empire state, and um, uh, little New Hampshire was uh, live free or die. Um, <laughs> Or I have to say, Dr. Alexandra Sununu, when, <laughs> when, your, when your brother was in Fly Free or Die was one of the things. <laughs> um, um, but, um, but with all, in all respect, with all respect. Um, and um, the, the Missouri, uh, the Midwestern states, very modest, like for instance, Oklahoma's license plate, as I read it, is Oklahoma's okay. <laughs> uh, Actually, no big deal, you know, no big deal. Um, North Dakota, their motto is, I translated from the Latin, it's trees are wood. <laughs> <laughs> and Lenny wouldn't understand that. He would think it was some sort of boo-boo, but it yeah. really is a, it's, it's very yeah. profound. And, and actually, there was, a, there was an argument in Wisconsin where some of the people didn't feel that America's dairy land um, really described them adequately. And someone suggested, eat cheese or die. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I made up mottos for some of those states, those rectangular states. Nebraska, I thought, should have on its license plate a long way across. <laughs> um, and the one I made up for Arkansas is not, it's sort of in a rough draft form, it's a little wordy still, uh, which is uh, Arkansas, not as bad as you might have imagined. <laughs> <laughs> Iowa is actually, we know the rules to Yahtzee. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think um, that it's because Bob Dole comes from one of those rectangular states, maybe s circular, that he said, we talking about immigration. We are the boiling pot. We have open arms. <laughs> well, I, think, I think Bob Dole was sort of, um, um, the interesting thing about Bob Dole was that, that he, didn't, he didn't talk very much, really. He's actually one of the few politicians who's actually funny. He can I mean, be Bob very Dole is yeah. really funny. He's sort of mean funny, but, but, but he's funny. And, and there are very few who are. Um, and it was said during the campaign that, that he was from Kansas uh, and that's why he didn't talk very much. And I said, this is really a bum rap. My, my sister's lived in Kansas longer than Dole ever lived in Kansas, and she can talk the eyeballs <laughs> right out of your head. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't think it's totally regional with Bob Dole. Gail, I'm going to address this one to you. Why do you think the press allowed both Clintons such a free ride prior to impeachment? Tax returns, commodities, draft, travel, office, Rose legal files, right wing conspiracy, et cetera? Uh, question mark, question mark. You know, I find it very ironic as a person who has worked at the New York Times that spends its entire life writing stories about all those things and getting no credit whatsoever because so few people want to read them. Um, there's tons written about it. You just aren't reading it. Nobody reads all that stuff. Actually, people read it. That's why they know about all of these yeah. things. Don't you think? They just wanted more. We want, if we don't like, a politician you that can't we want, too we, much yeah, we can't get enough of their, of their scandals and their stupidity, and mm -hmm. if we like somebody, we don't want to hear it at all. Right. Well, it used to be in the good old days before you had radio and stuff, you know, every newspaper was for one side or another, and you didn't have to read all this other stuff. You would only hear things you agreed about because you would only read that paper, and you would only hang out with people who belonged to your party. And people voted like crazy back then. They really enjoyed it a lot. Nobody was confused by hearing anything whatsoever except what they wanted to know. Well, I w I, I, she may have been wrong about vast right-wing conspiracy, but if she had used the phrase creepy little cabal, <laughs> um, <laughs> that would have been okay. Th that would have, that would have been, yeah. Now, I've All been those wonky little guys from the Federalist Society. Mm -hmm. I've gotten uh, all of the, the quotes that I've been citing, or most of them, from this book called The Stupidest Things Ever Said by Politicians. And it's a, as you can see, it's a pretty thick book. Uh, <laughs> and as I went through it, I found myself, I must admit, focusing on the people I thought were silly and ignoring the, 
the ones, people who, that I didn't think were silly, usually the ones I didn't think were silly had very long quotes, and the people who I thought uh, sh we should be making fun of had short quotes, which I appreciated because I didn't want to type all that much. Um, so that's what I, I copied down, but some of the things from the people I don't respect were really outrageous, like this one from Helen Chenoweth, you, you know she is from right. Idaho. Mm -hmm the favorite of She's the... She's the militia person. The, yeah, the militias. Potato. She said in reference to uh, the, um, the um, Endangered Species Act, a species goes out of existence every 20 seconds. Surely a new species must come into existence every 20, min uh, 20 seconds. You yeah, I mean should see some of the animals they have out there. <laughs> <laughs> no. In Idaho. She was uh, actually educated in Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> the Get out of here. <laughs> Both sort of Wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> she could have been. <laughs> well, I think we've pretty much come to the end of this, and I, I'm going to close with these words of wisdom from Gerald Ford. Things are more like they are now than they have ever been. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank you, all of you, for coming out here. Bruce McCall, Kate Clinton, Calvin Trillin. Gail Collins, thanks to Deborah Nadel McGee, Emily Hoffman. It's been fun. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.